Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, Lucas. Uh, thank you, uh, DLD, for having me here. Thanks, Steffi. Uh, thank you, uh, Hubert and Yossi. This is great. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, personal urban mobility. Uh, but let's start with asking, uh, why urban? So cities have gone, have gone on the global agenda uh, for various reasons. Uh, I'll touch on a few of them. Um, cities cover 2% of the Earth's inhabitable crust. More than 50% of us live in cities, and the number is growing. 75% of the energy worldwide is consumed in cities or in the infrastructures that service them. And in turn, 80% of CO2 or CO2 equivalent uh, emissions take place in cities and their infrastructures. So cities are a big deal. If we can do something about these, uh, it matters on the planetary level. Now, mobility is a key aspect of urbanization. How easy it is and efficient to move from one place to the other has significant economic impact, has impact on air quality, and on many indicators of happiness, people's happiness. The problem is that we've grown cities so big to the point where they can barely take in any more cars. Images like this have become part of uh, everyday life for many people. Many of us uh, spend hours in traffic. I think in the US alone, five and a half billion hours are spent in traffic every year. And the situation is not going to get any better, no matter how uh, greens, uh, green fuels get. So we need to come up with a different solution to this problem. At the same time, cities keep on growing, right? And with them, demand for transport, significantly growing. In search for, for an alternative to cars, people have started looking for other modes. So in the US, public transport uh, has been uh, on the rise for about a decade, while uh, highway vehicle miles driven is in decline. That's interesting. Miles driven per capita in Europe are in decline since the, since, since the early 90s, and in Japan it's even more significant. The young generation in the US today is getting a driver's license at the latest age since we saw the peak of cars. So people are getting their license at a later, later age. There's a saying that millennials, from an emotional standpoint, think about cars as we do about appliances, which is momentous. I mean, I'll think about it from my standpoint, just as an anecdote. If I came to MIT 20 years ago in a Ferrari, I'd be the coolest guy on campus. And if I did it today, people would think I'm bizarre. And, and, and that's, to me, that says a lot. So, as part of all of this, we're seeing a bicycle renaissance happening. Right, this is New York. There's a growing uh, use of bicycles all throughout the US and in Europe. This is um, a numbers from, I think, a 2009. The numbers are higher now. So increasing in Europe as well. This is Hangzhou in China. Many cities are adopting these uh, bicycle sharing system, and cycling is becoming part of people's daily commute in an increasing manner. The problem with all of this is that we've built our cities so big that we can't really move through them with mo without motorized transport. Sometimes we also put them in funny places like San Francisco and Rio. It's very hard uh, uh, not to use a car or, or, or another motorized mode of transport when you want to move through these places. Now let's pause for a second and look at another thing that we're all very familiar with. There's a transformation in technology that's been going on in the past 20 years. So we're all carrying uh, very powerful machines in our pockets, so we can communicate with each other anywhere in the world. Uh, we can communicate with machines, consuming data on the move. Cars are becoming instrumented with sensors. I think the average car today has uh, 400 sensors on board. Many of them go online. You can slap one of those on almost anything. This is a standard machine-to-machine -machine modem. And your object goes online. You can communicate with it. This is a prediction that I like to use by the CEO of Ericsson. He predicts that by 2020, we'll have more than 50 billion devices online. Now, even if he's you know, overestimating by a factor of two, it's still an order of magnitude more than we have people on this planet. 
So what it means is that these devices are not going to go into our pockets, right? They're going to go into the things around us, into our valuables, into infrastructures, into buildings. And that's exciting. That you can really flip it on its head and start to think about the city as if it were a computer in the open air. And what we're asking is, how can we take advantage of this new condition in order to improve on urban mobility? So back in the day when the project started at the MIT Sensible City Lab, we partnered with, uh, uh, with Rit Biargo, who was the Lord Mayor of Copenhagen back in the day, uh, in order to address that question in Copenhagen. Copenhagen uh, was very much a car city uh, in the early 70s, and they've implemented a whole bunch of measures to create this. Those of you who've been there know that. I mean, there's more bikes than people, I think. 1.08 bikes per person. 55% of the trips are done by bike in the city center. And I think 35% in the metro area. They, they cycle almost all year round. The age distribution uh, is very wide. So we thought if we can use technology to get more people to cycle in Copenhagen, we can probably translate it anywhere because they've already pricked all the low-hanging fruits. So we went ahead and started studying what gets people off of bicycles in the first place. And again, it fell back on urban form. So we found that 15 kilometers between home and work, so roughly 10 miles, uh, you see a big drop, uh, big drop off uh, in the amount of cycling. Hills are a deterrent. It turns out actually that on the way back from work, people are mostly uh, uh, um, reluctant to go on a hill. Maybe it's psychological, that people don't want to go on a battle uh, after a long day and they're tired. So we said, well, maybe motorizing the bicycle is a solution. We started looking around, realized that electric bikes are booming a market. It's three billion euros in Europe, half a billion in Japan, uh, quarter billion in, um, in Australia. It's growing very fast in, in the United States. But when you look at the product, you realize that they're very clunky, they're heavy, super expensive. I think the average electric bike uh, here in Europe costs almost 3,000 euros. So if we want to see millions of people flocking to bicycles, that is not the solution. So what we decided to do instead is leave the bike as is. Right? Many companies around the world can build beautiful bicycles, very good at it. At the best, we could make an incremental improvement to the bicycle. But when it comes to propulsion, to sensing, to robotics, to control, to streaming data, we can do a lot. We can really make a dent there. So we decided to focus on the rear wheel. To pack all the technology you need to transform your bicycle to something that's connected, something that can help you cope with the large master plans of today's cities, all into one unit that anybody can throw on their bike, almost like a sticker. Very easy in your soup top. So that was the vision. Uh, and like many things at MIT, when you have a funny idea, first you build it, and then you think about it. So uh, with a lot of soldering iron, um, we put together some batteries around the motor. This was done in partnership with the late Bichel, Bill uh, Mitchell's uh, lab at MIT. Put it on a wheel, spoke it up, and I took it to the mayor in Copenhagen to show it to her, see what she thinks. She liked it. The problem was that she liked it so much that she asked that we build 12 of those and present them at the keynote at the UN Climate Summit in 2009 with 150 mayors of the largest cities on the planet. So I got a bit scared. Um, but anyway, we hired, a, we subcontracted the manufacturer, uh, built those 12 units, presented an early prototype, a concept, in Copenhagen. And people loved it. It, 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 it was received very well. Um, and after the event, there were two years of continued development of the, of the technology uh, at MIT. Now, this was one of... Uh, I think 65 projects by then that the Sensible City Lab has done. And um, one thing that was different about it is exemplified here. We started receiving emails from individuals at home, over 13,000 e emails by the time that this uh, project was uh, over at MIT, where people asked, where can I buy it? It will change my commute. Where can I get it? And that got me excited to start thinking about taking it out of, uh, out of the university and really bringing it uh, uh, to the world. So uh, we founded Super Pedestrian, and um, it's a team of 25 people, 
some of the best robotics engineers in the Boston area, together with designers. There's also a team that develops uh, mobile apps, streaming data systems, uh, and web interfaces. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice warehouse in Cambridge. There's a facility in the back where we can go from sketches to full implementation of a prototype, as well as testing. So we can do the environmental testing, we can do fatigue tests, so all the stuff you need before you bring a product to manufacturing. Here's a quick video uh, that tells you uh, what the wheel is and what it does, and we'll take a look at the actual thing in a sec. This is the Copenhagen wheel. It turns your ordinary bicycle into a smart electric hybrid by simply replacing your back wheel. Connect it to your smartphone, download the app, and you're ready to go. This was on eight minutes. Bicycles are a great so way to move around. Wrong? Yet sometimes distances are too long. Five Hills can get in the way. Go. And hard journeys to work may leave you covered in sweat. The Copenhagen wheel is here to change all of that. The technology was developed over several years at MIT together with the city of Copenhagen, one of the world's most innovative places for cycling. Its original inventors licensed the technology and founded Super Pedestrian, the startup where we are now working around the clock to bring the wheel to you. Like the best riding companion, the Copenhagen wheel learns how you pedal and integrates seamlessly with your motion. It captures your energy when you brake or go downhill and gives you a push when you need it with three to 10 times your regular foot power. It's easy, ride it just like a normal bike. As you pedal, the motor automatically kicks in with no additional throttles or buttons. All technology for the Copenhagen wheel is contained within the red casing, including motor, removable batteries, wireless connectivity, smart locking, multiple sensors, and an embedded control system. Use your smartphone to customize your ride, monitor your physical activity, gather information from your environment to share with your friends and fellow cyclists. And if you're a software developer, you can even create your own biking apps. So whether you carry yourself, your kids, or your gear, hills seem flat, distances shrink, and you can cycle just about anywhere. So transform your bike and transform the city. The Copenhagen Wheel. So that's, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ed, do you want to come here with a bike? Let's take a look at the thing itself. So for me, this is particularly exciting. We haven't shown it in public yet. This is the first time we've just began manufacturing. Uh, we were here four years ago at DLD presenting the concept, and it's really, uh, it's really exciting to have it materialized uh, here with us again at DLD. So, uh, let me just give you a brief description uh, of what it does. It's hard to really uh, feel it unless you put your butt on it. Uh, so we'll catapult ourselves through the people later uh, and ride it, whoever of you um, who wants to, uh, to go for a demo later. Um, so we put strong emphasis when we designed this thing uh, on responsiveness. We wanted the bike to stay just a bike. So the experience of using it is just pedaling. To do this, we put about 12 different sensors in there. Torque and power and linear speed, rotational velocity, acceleration in three axes, headway, inertial sensing of all sorts. And with this, we characterize the pedaling behavior of the rider very precisely. And there is about six control boards inside distributed throughout the wheel that crunch this data up and in real time tell the motor how to sort of seamlessly integrate uh, with the rider's motion. So, the cycling just feels like cycling, and you think that the city just shrunk underneath, underneath your feet, or that you became Gulliver, or, or lost half your weight, depends on your psychology. Um, when you backpedal, it regenerates and captures, uh, captures the kinetic energy and puts it back in the batteries. And there's a whole bunch of um, data that you get, A, when you ride, so you see information. Actually, I can, I can show you the data as it's coming in. So this is a ride we took with a wheel. So you can change modes. You see that's the app on the right. And you can write your own modes as well. And developers can write their own modes. So one person developed a mode called Flatten My City, which uses sensors to detect hills and just make them feel like they disappeared. Otherwise, it does nothing. And then it 
the map below is data that you can get after the ride at home, quantifying your physical activity, quantifying your ride. We're getting information all the way to the level of wattage coming out of your feet. So it's, it's real units. It's not points or, 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 or some funny present. Uh, real physical units that we measure on this. Uh, and also on our back end, uh, we're getting about 120 reports from this thing five times a second about the state of the system so we can make sure everything's working properly. And this is also big for doing service because you can flush firmware remotely and give the best technical support from our uh, offices to people's home. So I, I want to end with a... With a sort of a short reflection on this. This, to me, is, uh, is part of a wave globally that's happening now with technologies where we don't only sense and quantify our bodies or things around us, we also close the feedback loop and actuate objects so that they become animated, so that they become interactive uh, and respond to us. And that has the capacity for really making a dramatic improvement on lifestyle. For, uh, it has the potential to help us address some of the key problems uh, that we're facing today. Um, thank you very much. I'll end here. Demos in the back uh, afterward if you want.